battle is more full of names than yours. Our men more perfect in the use of arms. Our armor all as strong. Our cause the best. Then reason wills our hearts should be as good. My name is Kabir Bedi, and though I have been quoting Shakespeare, those lines do epitomize the call to war for a nation dedicated to peace. Unfortunately, war is sometimes a sad necessity. When war defines victory of good over evil, of right over wrong, then much glory is attached to the act of winning and defeating one's enemies. It's with such thoughts that I welcome you to our series on the wars that India had to fight to safeguard her borders and sovereignty. Today we begin with the first in a series of shows on the tales of war and the Indian soldier, of guns and glory. On 16th December 1971, at around 4.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, Lieutenant General Amir Abdullah Khan Niazi, Martial Law Administrator and Commander of the Eastern Command, Pakistan, attached his signature to a one-page document. A minute later, Lieutenant General Jagjit Singh Arora, General Officer Commanding-in-Chief of the India and Bangladesh Forces in the Eastern Theater, countersigned the instrument of surrender. surrender 1,500 kilometers away, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi announced India in Parliament, Dhaka is now the free capital of a free country. The applause was deafening and prolonged. In one swift war, India achieved its biggest military and diplomatic victory ever. Pakistan stood dismembered and humiliated. With the signing of that instrument of surrender, Bangladesh became a reality. Pakistan lost what was then called East Pakistan, and with it, almost 20% of its landmass and more than 60% of its population. But how did this war between India and Pakistan come about? just six years since the last one? And how did it end in just 13 days? And why did India take such great risk of international censure and send in its troops to invade East Pakistan? By the end of April 1971, Violence and genocide in East Pakistan had driven an estimated 10 million refugees into India. The situation was proving an immense strain on the fledgling Indian economy. And all indications anticipated that millions of others were ready to cross over. In Islamabad, the military dictator General Yahya Khan refused to acknowledge that East Pakistani citizens were fleeing to India by the millions. These people who you saw were not refugees from East Pakistan. I can arrange a lot of uh, influx of refugees into Pakistan. If you'd like to come with me to East Pakistan, I'll show you how they're coming from India. But they're not coming in, nor are my refugees going back to India. Despite India's own difficulties, the East Pakistanis were accommodated in refugee camps and provided with food and shelter. Meanwhile, in East Pakistan, the local population was up in arms against their military and the administration. They were being brutally subjugated by the Pakistani army. Indira Gandhi was aware that events were hurtling towards a situation when India might have to intervene more directly and more forcefully. I don't think we can shut our eyes to the situation in a neighboring state. I think, and I personally think that most of the world believes this, so they may not be willing to say it out openly, that Pakistan as it existed can never be the same again. 
Ever since its creation in 1947, Pakistan had been plagued by the imbalance of its two parts. More than 1,500 kilometers of Indian soil separated West and East Pakistan. Both parts shared a common religion, but were divided by distance, culture, language, and economics. West Pakistan was many times larger in size and had the nation's capital. But East Pakistan accounted for 75% of the population. West Pakistan monopolized the civil services, the armed forces, and the diplomatic corps. East Pakistan accounted for 75% of all exports and foreign earnings, yet only received 30% of all imports and investments. West Pakistan was the ruler, and East Pakistan the producer of goods. In the 23 and a half years of its union, West Pakistan treated East Pakistan as its colony. <laughs> Then, in 1970, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman won the first near-free elections in almost two decades. The elections were held in December 1970, and Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who was from East Pakistan and his Awami League, got a clear majority, with 167 out of 313 seats in Pakistan's national parliament and an overwhelming 298 out of 310 seats in the Provincial Assembly. By every measure, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman had earned the right to become the next Prime Minister of Pakistan and form its government. I am the President of the people of Bengal, legally, morally. I am the man who can govern this country. The military junta, headed by General Yahya Khan, loathed to see this happen. They preferred the West Pakistani leader, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, over Mujib. On the 1st of March, 1971, after attempts to find a compromise failed, General Yahya Khan announced an indefinite postponement to the opening of parliament. In retaliation, Sheikh Mujib called a general strike the next day. <laughs> Riots followed, and some Bengali units of the Pakistani army mutinied. On March 25th, the martial law administrator of East Pakistan, Lieutenant General Tikka Khan, received orders from Rawalpindi, West Pakistan, to sort things out. The same night, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was arrested and sent off to a secret location, and the Pakistani army began a large-scale and brutal crackdown, targeting Awami League leaders and the Bengali intelligentsia. The refugees started coming in, and government of India was tough with its refugees. Mr. Gandhi then took a decision that we must help the freedom fighters and help the people of Bangladesh. And that is how we got involved. India began to provide political, diplomatic, and moral support to the Mukti Bahini, the guerrilla force that began covert operations against the Pakistani army. Bengali troops in the East Pakistan Army mutinied and deserted in large numbers to join the Mukti Bahini. Indira Gandhi told General Manikshaw to prepare for war, while she launched a diplomatic campaign to create awareness about the situation in East Pakistan. During the summer of 1971, Mrs. Gandhi toured world capitals, telling the international community to intervene in Pakistan to end its continuing atrocities. But America and its Western allies remained aloof, and the Soviet bloc, which backed India, did not have much influence over Pakistan. In 1971, when the monsoons hit East Pakistan, all plans for offensive action on the ground were halted. The rivers of Bengal were in spate, and at places, 
They were flowing five to six kilometers wide. Every drain, rivulet, and field was overflowing. But still, the preparations for battle continued at breakneck speed on both sides because war had become inevitable. So we moved 30,000 tons of stores to Tripura alone. So we have built up the infrastructure and the logistics during the monsoon. So when the wars did start, we did not look back. Against uh, there are a few artillery pieces. You can say around Tripura there were more than 80, more than 80 big artillery cannons deployed by the Indian Army all along the border of Tripura. On December 3rd, 1971, at 5.45 p.m., Pakistan launched preemptive airstrikes on forward Indian air bases. Srinagar, Avantipur, Pathankot, Uttaralai, Jodhpur, Ambala, and Agra. India and Pakistan were once again at war, an incredible third time in less than 25 years. Pakistan launched a full In a radio broadcast shortly before midnight, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi addressed the nation. Taking advantage of the full moon on the night of December 3rd, 1971, a second wave of Pakistan Air Force came bombing and strafing the Indian airfields. Both these attempts were so clumsy that not one Indian aircraft was lost on the ground. The Indian Air Force retaliated fiercely. While the Pakistani planes were still on their way back, Canberra bombers from Agra took off to bomb Pakistani targets. The IAF attacked Chanderi, Shorkot, Sargoda, Muri, Mianwali, Masroor near Karachi, Risalwala in Rawalpindi, and Changamanga in Lahore. The IAF relentlessly mounted an ever-increasing number of sorties over both West and East Pakistan. By the time the war was nearing its end, the IAF was flying 500 sorties a day, the highest number of air attacks since the Second World War. Hunters had been uh, brought in in 56, 57. They were also available to us. Nats were available to us. And more importantly, MiG-21, which had come in 62, 61, 62, were now fully operational. And we had a very large number of uh, MiG-21s. In 1971, the Nat fighters of the Indian Air Force found for themselves a permanent spot in the glorious annals of air warfare. And the most memorable of all Nats was flown by Flying Officer Nirmaljit Singh Sekhon of the number 18 Flying Bullet Squadron. Flying from Srinagar on December the 14th, Sekhon single-handedly took on six Pakistani F-86 Sabres. With exceptional bravery, he engaged them all single-handedly and scored hits on two of them. The nation's highest gallantry award, the Paramvir Chakra, was posthumously awarded to Flying Officer Sekhon. The war officially began on 3rd December 1971, when Pakistan carried out its preemptive strikes against India. But even if Pakistan had not struck, war would have broken out the next day. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi had already given the nod to General Manekshaw to commence operations on the 4th, but Pakistan claimed for itself the tag of aggressor. War was inevitable. Both countries had been preparing for months. While their armies stood eyeball to eyeball in the western sector, there were constant skirmishes 
that escalated into all-out battles in the east. Village Garipur lay on the highway that went to Jessore, an important and strategic town in East Pakistan. In mid-November 1971, to stop the atrocities of the East Pakistan Army in the region, the 14 Punjab Battalion moved to occupy the village. They were supported by air, artillery, and a tank squadron with 14 PT-76 tanks. To evict the Indians, East Pakistan's 107 Infantry Brigade launched a massive attack on the night of November 21st. Indian advance positions heard the tanks coming through the winter fog and reported their exact locations to Command Central. For the entire night, the battle raged between the East Pakistani Brigade, which was much, much larger in numbers than the sole Indian battalion. Around 8.30 in the morning, when the sun broke through the mist, 11 destroyed and three abandoned Pakistani tanks became visible. One of the reasons that the war in the East was short and sweet for India was that the Pakistani army was very low in morale when they went into battle. There were many reasons for the low fighting spirit of the Pakistani army, but one of them certainly was the Battle of Garipur. East Pakistan was one of the most difficult terrains in which to wage a war. There was a river, stream or nala to cross every few kilometers. India's near obsolete PT-76 amphibious tanks proved very useful as the Indian Army began the invasion of East Pakistan on the 4th of December, 1971. Crossing wet, soggy terrains, the wide deck of the PT-76 could accommodate a 12-man squad and a platoon could be crammed aboard if the crossing was uncontested. But let's shift focus to the western sector once again on the night of 4th December, when, in the cloak of darkness, 59 Pakistani tanks approached Boundary Pillar 638 in Rajasthan. Boundary Pillar 638 marked the international border between India and West Pakistan close to a small hamlet called Longewala in the Thar Desert. On the night of 4th, 5th December, a forward patrol at the border heard noises of a major movement of armor. In Longewala, there was only a single company, the 23 Punjab Regiment, under the command of Major Chandpuri. When Major Chandpuri was informed of the movement of heavy armor in his direction, he sent urgent messages to his battalion headquarters for reinforcement and support. But in the meantime, he positioned his men to stop the advancing Pakistanis at any cost. At 4.30 a.m. on December the 5th began the famous Battle of Longewala, where a single company of the Indian Army held back the West Pakistan Army with its Chinese-built T-59 tanks of the 22nd Cavalry and a squadron of U.S.-built Sherman tanks. Behind the tanks, came Pakistan's 20th Frontier Force Battalion. Within the first few minutes, the Indian Army scored a direct hit on one T-59 tank and a Pakistan Army Jeep carrying a senior officer. The Pakistani advance paused, regrouped, then began to move forward again. Major Chanpuri's men fought with valor and against immense odds and kept the West Pakistan Army from overrunning Longewala. Tank after tank was stopped in its tracks because of the bravery of the men of 23 Punjab. As soon as day broke, hunters of the IAF flying in pairs from Jaisalmer joined the battle. The first pair took care of six Pakistani tanks. In the meantime, ground troops and artillery units began arriving, reinforcing Major Chanpuri's brave men. 
the Pakistani armor panicked and abandoning all war discipline and their own battle plan, began to run helter-skelter to avoid being blown up. By midday of 5th December, the Battle of Longavala was all but over. The remaining Pakistani forces limped back across the border, with only eight of their battle tanks in functioning order. Spread across the desert battleground of Longavala lay the 51 other tanks they had come with in the hope of attacking Jaisalmer. For months before the war broke out, West Pakistan had been secretly sending reinforcements to East Pakistan using commercial Pakistan International Airways flights that flew via Colombo. Entire divisions of the Pakistan Army were sent on these commercial flights. Heavy equipment was transported by ship. But then, something strange happened. In November, Indian listening posts along the coast picked up chatter from the submarine PNS Ghazi as it was laying mines in the Bay of Bengal. Alas, we've run out of time today, but we'll continue talking about what happened to submarine Ghazi and the war in 71 next week in the next episode of Guns and Glory.